Well, today we start a new series called Here's Your Sign. Here's your sign. Now you've got a sign, one of our signs that we're going to be talking about today, and it's the stop sign. All right. We're looking at God's signs, his road signs for financial success. God's road signs so that you and I can live in uh, the blessing that we believe that God wants for us. So we want to follow these signs. Um, I've got, just to kind of kick off, I've got some humorous signs to show you. And uh, I don't have them memorized, so I'm going to have to kind of look around. Uh, But the first sign that I've got, these are real signs. Uh, This is uh, the dog library. Take a stick, leave a stick. I saw that. I love that. Uh, How many dog people in the room? You dog people? Okay. How many cat people are in the room? I'm so sorry. All right. Um, Kim and I, we love dogs. We love cats. We've had cats before, but the thing about dogs, every time they see you, without fail, they're happy to see you. And the thing about a cat is that every time they see you, they're annoyed that you're breathing the same air that they are. Well, that was a real sign uh, that someone put out. Uh, This next sign is about freedom of speech. Without freedom of speech, we would not know who the idiots are. Now, I realize it's probably not very nice, but I absolutely love that sign, okay? And then this one. How many, how many people struggle to drive in Atlanta traffic? I don't mean struggle to drive, but struggle to maintain your Christianity. Let's, uh, okay, uh, it's a lane, not a birthright. Let them merge. And then my favorite one, this is my favorite one. This is for our teenagers, okay? Uh, teenagers, tired of being harassed by your stupid parents? Act now. Move out. Get a job. Pay your own bills while you still know everything. And I love, love, love our teenagers, okay? Uh, Kim and I have been uh, working with them on Wednesday night. If you have middle school or high schoolers, bring them. And I promise, I promise We'll mock and make fun of them on Wednesday nights as well. All right, so no, I'm just kidding. We have a wonderful time on our Wednesday night service. So I hope you'll be able to bring your students. And uh, it's going to be, a, I think it'll be a great, great opportunity for them. And we're having a wonderful time. Well, signs are given to us to direct, protect, and correct us. Okay, I want you to think about those three words. Uh, signs are given to direct protect and correct. Direct, protect, and correct. Everybody say that with me. Direct, protect, and correct. Okay? God gives us financial road signs for the same purpose. He wants to direct us and how we deal with money. He wants to protect us from worshiping money from mishandling and mismanaging money, from having the wrong attitude about money. And then he gives us loving correction so that we can live in a blessed life financially. Now, just so you know, I am not a, what is called a prosperity preacher. I do not believe that just because you may give that God owes you a brand new Cadillac. Or just because you may give that you're going to become a millionaire. I don't believe that. Uh, There are some people that are very faithful to give and they never become wealthy. But perspective is the key here. The word prosper in the Old Testament means that God pushes you forward. God wants to push you forward. And the prosperity that God promises us is undeniable in Scripture when we are generous, when we obey Him with our finances, okay? God wants to push you forward. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to win the lottery this next week, okay? I had someone ask me before the service, Pastor, what would you do if somebody came to you and said, I just won that $1.9 billion or whatever it is lottery. Without hesitation, I said, you better tithe. All right, so 
uh, um, you know, just because you do one thing wrong doesn't mean you should do two things wrong. Is what I'm saying, okay? Kim and I have talked about that. What would happen if I won that? And I asked Kim that. She looked at me. She said, you dummy, you actually have to buy a ticket if you're going to win it. All right, so I'm not one uh, that does that too much. But uh, the fact is, God wants to bless you. I believe he wants to bless you financially. You cannot deny that in Scripture, that when you obey him in financial principles and in generosity, that God pushes you forward. Now, prosperity is not just about money. God will prosper you in many ways in your life when you obey him. And once again, this is not about just about your money. Because you need to understand, God does not need your money. Do you really believe that the one who created the universe needs your 10%? No. He doesn't need it. He has, he's not doing this because he needs to build up the bank of heaven. But the fact is, you and I desperately need God to bless our money. And the Bible is very clear that when you and I put God first, when we tithe, when we begin to follow him and obey biblical principles, following the financial road signs, that God will begin to bless our life and that he will lift the curse He will rebuke the devourer for our sake. The Bible is very clear about that. So in this series, we're going to look, and our goal is to see God as our source. To see God as your source. Not your job, not the economy, not politicians, but to see God as your source. And I want to read to you a verse that's kind of our theme verse for this series over the next three weeks. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, who is the source of all things. And we exist for Him. Now, if you get this verse down... And you begin to live this out in your life, I promise you, your life is going to be better. You're going to be blessed. You're going to have less stress in your life. You're going to have more peace in your life. You're going to see God use you more because He is the source. And if you exist for Him, seeing Him as your source, then everything in life gets so much better. And so that is our goal over. Uh, the next three weeks. Well, today, our sign is stop. We're going to talk about the stop sign today. Now, this is a little different than I normally preach. This is a topical message. And uh, so, since we're doing a topical message, I'm going to give you the point first, and then I'm going to read the passage, okay? So, point number one, stop the worry. Stop the worry. Don't worry. Stop worrying. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Be happy. Do you get it? Okay. God wants us to stop the worry. Now listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 33. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now, let's just pause. Is Jesus saying you shouldn't worry about having a job or having food or feeding your family or providing for others? No, that's not what he's saying. He said, don't worry about this. He said, don't put this at the center of your life. Don't be anxious about it. Let me, let me take a, a, an honesty survey. Now, you raise your hand and be honest, okay? I'm not calling anybody out, but I want you to raise your hand if this is true about you. How many of you have ever been anxious or worried about finances? Raise your hand. Everybody, everybody, everybody worries about it. And and let me ask you a question. Don't raise your hand on this one. But how many have ever uh, run out of money before you run out of months? Anybody ever done that before? You don't need to raise your hand, okay? We've all been there, okay? Okay. Hopefully, you're not continuing to do this after years and years and years and years, but sometimes life happens. How many of you know that occasionally, let me rephrase that, 
that often, let me rephrase that, that all the time unexpected things happen. Anybody, anybody ever, I live by a budget and for years and years, Kim and I, we have lived by a budget. This is, we put it in, we put our money in the bank and we have so much that we save and so much we put in retirement and so much that we give and then so much that we spend. And even though we are very good at living on a budget, you know what is interesting? Almost every month, I'll look at our finances, I look at the budget, I think, man, we're going to have a little left over this month. And I'm really, really excited about that. And inevitably, there's something that I have to buy. Anybody else experience that? It's easy to get anxious over money. Jesus is not saying that you're a bad person if you've ever worried about money, but he's telling us to refocus so that we can see who our real source is. You know, when I was a child, I don't think I ever worried about food. I mean, I worried about eating it, of course, you know. Uh, the only thing I worried about was if my mom made me eat something that I didn't want to eat. Now, there are very few things that I didn't want to eat. But sometimes, you know, nasty broccoli, I didn't want to eat it, all right? And uh, my wife still tries to get me to eat broccoli. She tells me it's healthy. And I'm like, no, that's the devil's food, all right? So, um, but whatever it is, I didn't really worry about that. You know why? Because my dad, my mom, they were my source. As an eight-year-old, I don't ever remember thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I wonder if we're going to have supper today. I never worried about that. You know why? Because I saw my parents as my source. I didn't worry about it. God's saying to you and me, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? Isn't that a great question? By worrying, we don't solve anything. We can't add a single moment to our life. We can't make ourselves taller. Uh, if that was so, I'd be seven feet tall and uh, retired from the NBA. All right. When I was a teenage boy, when I was on my 13th birthday, I was five feet, six inches tall. On my 14th birthday, I was six feet, one inch tall, and I grew seven inches in one year, and the doctor told my parent, parents that I was going to be about six, six, and I was so excited, and I never got any taller. Now, I did get rounder, okay, but I didn't get any taller. Maybe the doctor was saying that I was going to be six foot, six inches around and not six foot, six inches tall. But by worrying, you can't add a single inch to your height. Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? L let me put a pin in that and just tell you this story real quick. When you, by faith, see God is your source. God does miraculous things. Even though it may not be a giant miracle, it's something that absolutely blows your mind at his faithfulness. Talking about, you don't need to worry about what you're going to wear. When I was in eighth grade, uh, my mom and dad had just gone in the ministry and they were really struggling financially. It was really tight. And I really... My parents, the only thing they could afford to buy me was clothes from Goodwill. Now, the fact is, that's probably pretty cool. My kids, they love going to Goodwill and shopping. I'd rather be poked in the eye with a sharp stick than go do that personally. But that's just me. And that's not about Goodwill. I don't want to go to anywhere and search for clothes, okay? But when I was in eighth grade, I needed a suit. Now, my parents were really tight financially. And I was going to have to actually be in a suit. It was a, an event I was going to. There was no way that I was not going. I mean, I could not participate in the event without a suit. And I didn't own a suit. 
And what I had to have was a blue suit. And then, you know, like a, a white shirt and a tie that I had to wear to this event. And my mom, um, they didn't have the money. They didn't know what in the world they were going to do. My mom, she checked her wallet. She checked how much money she had. And I believe the number was $9.98. It was something like that. $9.98. That's all the money she had. And my mom and dad tithed. They put God first. They were generous. And my mom said, Lord, you told us not to worry. And my son has got to do this event and we don't have the money to buy him a suit. A, a suit back then, I don't know, it would cost $100 maybe, something like that. And she said, come on, Richie, get in the car. We're gonna go get you a suit. I'm like, okay. I wasn't really that excited about getting a suit. But nevertheless, I knew that I had to have one. So I jumped in the car with my mom. We went to the mall. And uh, we went, I don't even remember the name of the store that we went in, but we went to this store. My mom prayed and she said, uh, let's pray before we go in. I'm like, what? She's like, let's pray before we go in. So we prayed that God would give us a suit that would fit me and would cost $9.98. And I'm like, wow, that is, uh, that's some prayer there, mom. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say this. We went in and there was a clearance rack. And my mom, she asked one of the employees, she said, uh, you know, is this the best prices you've got? I got to get my son a suit. They said, yeah, here it is. And uh, everything on this is on clearance. And it's also like whatever the number is, it's like 40% off or something. And it was something ridiculous. Well, to make a long story short, my mom, she found a suit that was exactly my size. And she went to the register and had a discount and when they rang it up with taxes, it was $9.98. Now, I know that's not a huge miracle that changes uh, the course of a nation or the course of a church. But you know what that was? It was exactly what Jesus was saying to people that see him as their source. Don't worry, because I'm going to take care of you. Well, he says, don't worry about what we will wear, for the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, um, the, the word all there, I know uh, that y'all know that I study and I went to seminary and I've studied Greek and Hebrew and all this stuff. And I got to tell you what this word all in the Greek language means. Are you ready? It means all. All of these things. What things? What you're going to wear. What you're going to eat. Where you're going to live. How you're going to pay your bills how God's going to sustain you, how he's going to bless you. All of these things are going to be added to you if you will seek first the kingdom of God. Now, what do we got to stop doing? We got to stop what all of us are guilty of. We got to stop the worry and see God as our source. Let me just give you a couple of thoughts from uh, that particular passage. Life is more than money. You know, sometimes if we don't stop and reflect and stop and think and stop and worship God, we just start thinking that life is all about stuff. It's all it is. My house, my car, my clothes. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a house or a car, and there's certainly nothing wrong with having clothes because I would not be up here pastoring if, if you didn't wear clothes to church, okay? I'm just going to tell you, I turned that over to Jonathan. I was like, good luck. God bless you, buddy. I'll see you later. So life is more than money. Life is valuable to God. That's what Jesus was telling us. You're valuable to God. You're more than just money. Uh, worry is a waste. Have you ever noticed that worry doesn't help, but it hurts? 
uh, worry will even hinder your health. And so we worry. Have you ever noticed that most of the stuff that we worry about, we have no control over anyway? I mean, we have zero control over it. Why worry? The eternal is greater than the temporal. That's what Jesus was saying. God knows your needs, and he is the source of our provision. And here's the principle, and I want to give it to you. When I focus on stuff, I worry. When I focus on stuff, I worry. But when I focus on God, I have peace. You get the difference? What God wants for you and me to do is to be blessed, yes. He wants to take care of our needs, yes. And and the Bible is clear. You can have as much money as you earn legally and you work for, okay? There's nothing wrong with being wealthy, okay? There's everything wrong with being inward focused and not thinking about the eternal. Uh, But God doesn't care if you have a lot of money. But when you focus on God rather than your money, you will have peace. And that's what God wants for your life. Philippians 4, 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to focus there in the middle of that sentence, the two words, according to. My God shall supply all your needs according to. His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, let me explain to you what that means. Um, If the verse said, my God will supply all your needs out of, that is a different meaning than according to. Let me explain to you. Let's say you came to me and you said, um, Pastor, I'm really struggling Financially, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. I'm about to lose my house, about to lose my car. I don't know where I'm going to get food for my kids from. And you say, can you help me? And if I were to give you out of my riches, which I'm not rich, but uh, if I were to give you out of what I had in the bank account, then I might give you 20 bucks or 100 bucks, or whatever. I was giving it to you out of what I have. Now, that's limited, okay? I'm not giving you according to. I'm giving you out of. Now, on the other hand, if you came to me and said, Pastor, I'm struggling. I'm about to lose my house. I'm about to lose my job. I'm about to lose my car. I don't know where I'm going to be able to feed my kids. And I gave you my checkbook, and I said, Whatever you need, whatever you need, if it's in there, you can have it. That is the difference between according to and out of. What God promises to do for you is to supply all of your needs, not out of what he has, but according to what he has. And he owns it all. And there's not anything that he cannot supply in the needs in your life. So that's the principle. Stop the worry. Here's the second principle. I'm going to give it to you. Stop the waste. Stop the waste. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not store up for uh, riches for yourself here on earth where moths and rust destroy and robbers break in and steal. Instead, store up riches for yourself in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and robbers cannot break in and steal. For your heart will always be where your riches are. Now, in some translations, it reads kind of in reverse, and I I like that. Um, In the old King James, it says it this way, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if you want to know where your heart is, look at where you spend your money. That's where your heart is. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You want your heart to be in a position to worship God, in a position to be blessed by God, in a position to obey God, then put your money where God tells you to and your heart will follow, 
Okay? We often think that our money follows the heart, but it's actually the heart follows the money. You want to learn how to have more faith? You want to learn how to be a blessing financially? Then learn the principles of giving and generosity. And when you do, your heart will follow. I I can't tell you how many times I've seen that worked out in my own life. You give towards some project. Uh, Years ago, uh, we started, um, we helped start uh, Endawa Yatimba. Uh, the Children's Village in South Africa. It's for AIDS orphans. I've been there 10 times. Uh, Our church bought, helped buy the land, build the first building. We've just been a major financial supporter for years of uh, of that program. And what I've found is that the more I've given to that, the more I love it. I, I didn't wait until I really began to, you know, well, when my heart gets warmer or softer, I'll give to that. But you know what I found is that the more I put my treasure there, the more my heart follows it. And I've been able to be there and watch and hear testimony of kids that started out when they were two and three years old and now they've graduated from high school. And I've heard them give me from their own mouth their testimony of how they received Christ, how they followed Christ in baptism, how they are going to live their life for the Lord. And you know what? My heart bursts with joy. You know why? Because where my treasure is, there my heart will also be. So what the point here is this. Stop the waste. You say, what do you mean, stop the waste? Well, uh, just a couple thoughts. What God owns lasts forever. Everything else is wasted. What God owns lasts forever. So what you give to him. I've done a lot of funerals in my life. In fact, went to a funeral yesterday. And you know what I've never seen? I've never seen anybody take it with them. I hear people talk about, you know, wealthy people, and, and I had someone ask me one time, I wonder how much he left his kids. And I looked at him, I said, all of it. Every cent. I mean, we don't get to take it with us. We can send it ahead, but we can't take it with us. I heard about one guy that was very wealthy, and uh, his, his desire, and it was in his will, that he wanted his wealth cashed and he wanted his, he had three sons and he wanted them to put $3 million of cash in his casket. And he made them swear before he died that they were gonna do this and they would honor him and and, uh, so they did. And so they had the funeral, the casket was open and there's all this pile of money in there with a guy, he's lying uh, in the casket and they had the funeral and, and the service and everything. And people were coming by after the service and, uh, and after they had uh, buried him. And, and the oldest brother, he began to weep. He looked at his two younger brothers. He said, I got a confession to make. He said, my dad made me promise that we put that money in the casket. And we did. But I've just got so many financial needs right now. When nobody was looking, I have a lot of credit card debt. And I took $20,000 out of that casket. I'm just so sorry. The next youngest brother, he began to hang his head. He's like, since you confessed that, I've got a confession to make too. He said, man, you know, I have wanted this brand new platinum Ford truck. And, you know, they cost over $100,000 now. And I've wanted it for so long. And he said, you know... I, I didn't know anything else to do, and I, when nobody was looking, I took a hundred grand in cash out of that casket. The youngest brother, he just gasped. He said, I can't believe you two. We made a promise to our father that we would put his money in the casket with him. I can't believe how dishonest both of you are. And they looked at him, they said, Did you not take any money from it? He goes, I took all $3 million and I put a check in that, uh, in that casket and buried it with him. Now, here's the point. You don't get to take any of it with you. 
but you can send it ahead. What is not given to God is eventually wasted. Now, I'm not trying to suggest to you that um, providing for your family is a waste or buying a car is a waste or having a house is a waste. I'm not suggesting that, okay? Please don't hear what I'm not saying. What I'm saying is that everything eventually that we have is going to be gone. You can't take any of it. I don't care how wealthy you are. You can be a multi-billionaire and you don't get to take any of it with you because eventually it all gets left behind. So what are you going to do to stop the waste? Well, realize we're going to live forever through what we give. You know what is not wasted? The money you give to the cause of Christ, the money you give through the church in order to see people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. My dearest friend at the time, his name was Kenny, and um, he was very successful and uh, was a man that um, was, a, was a giver. He, he loved to give, and he loved to support the cause of Christ. And I'll never forget that he rang my doorbell one, one day. It was a Saturday morning, and I opened the door and said, hey, Kenny, what's going on, man? And he said, well, I heard you're getting ready to start a church getting ready to start this church. I said, yeah, man, I feel like that's what God wants us to do. He said, well, I'd like to have a little part in it. And he handed me the check for $10,000, the very first money that we ever got to start this church. It was just a few months later that I did his funeral. He was driving with his family. His family had gone ahead. He was driving to go to the beach, and he lost control of his car and he crashed and had to do his funeral, my best friend. And I've thought about it. In fact, Kim and I, not too long ago, we stopped by the cemetery. We went to look at his grave. And I remembered, Kenny gave the first money of anyone to start this church. You know what he learned a long time before he ever breathed his last here on this earth? He learned that we live forever through what we give. And you know what I believe with all my heart? I believe that when we stand before God, they're going to be, we've seen 2,404 or something like that people get saved in the services over the 21 years in this church. That's a lot of people. You know what I believe? He lives forever through their life. Now, so do you. Every time you give, every time you stop the waste, you are putting resources into the kingdom of God. A heart that is set on God is generous and contented. Let let me just kind of wrap this thing up. Have you ever noticed how quickly we adjust to something that we have desired for a long time? For example, Let's say you really have desired this house. Maybe you saw a house. Maybe it was an apartment. And man, you're just like in your heart. Nothing wrong with wanting a new house. Nothing wrong with it loving where you live. Nothing wrong with it. But have you ever noticed that something that you've wanted, you really desired, maybe it was a new car, maybe it was a new outfit. You ever notice that when you get it, before long the new wears off? They talk about with car, that new car smell wears off. And I'm telling you, the smell of a monthly payment is a stench in the nostrils compared to that new car smell, right? Let let, let me give you the process. Here's what we go through. First of all, excitement. We get excited when we get it. Second of all, is acceptance. Before long, we get used to it. And it's not so great after a while. We start to notice the problems with it. And number three is expectation. We begin to feel that we are owed something or that we deserve it and we can't live without it. And then number four is discontentment. You ever notice that before long you start to look for something bigger or newer or greater or nicer or shinier? And once again, I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with loving a house liking your car, keeping it clean. I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with that. But what I am saying is to avoid this vicious cycle of discontentment, because this is where our heart goes, 
If we don't recognize the pattern, we must see God as the owner, ourselves as the stewards, and Jesus as our contentment. You see, until you get that concept down, you're never, ever going to be long-term contented with what you have. You'll always get discontented, no matter how big the house. Before long, you're like, ah, oh, it's not that big, it's not that great, it's not that wonderful. No matter how nice the car. Before long, you know, uh, when you first get it, you'll park a mile from Walmart in the parking lot to keep somebody from dinging the door. You know what I'm talking about? And then after you've had it for a while, you'll squeeze in between two tractor and trailers that are about to crush you. And you're like, ah, no big deal. Bang the door when you open it. And don't worry about it when you walk in. Stop the waste. Now, I'm not going to talk about this last point. Uh, but I, I, I could. Um, the last point is this. Stop the worship. And I won't read all the verses that I've got. But when we tithe, God blesses us. And tithing helps us to worship God rather than money is the point. Okay? And when you tithe, you stop the worship. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody worships money. In fact, I'm not suggesting that you tend to do that at all. It's not a suggestion. It is that every one of us, if we do not guard our hearts, will worship money or stuff or the things that are associated with it. Uh, Even those of you, I know some people are more, women tend to be more about relationships and men tend to be more about things, material things. Uh, that's just the way God has geared us. I'm not saying every woman is that way or every man is that way. But I do know that my wife, when she meets you, she'll know everything about you before she finishes the conversation with you. She'll know where you work. She'll know your family, the kids, if you have grandkids or not. She'll know cousins and she'll know their birthdays, all right, by the end of a conversation. Me, on the other hand... I played basketball in a league for three years one time. Same group of guys, three years. We played together three times a week. Three freaking years. I didn't know a single one of their last names. All right, so women are different than men when it comes to that. Okay, so I'm not suggesting that you don't have your own, your own deal or your own bent. But I'm saying that if you don't learn to put God first and stop the worship, you will be consumed by the things that God never intended for you to worship. Money, career, reputation. Let let me get down with our younger generation. Likes, followers, number of people that are following you on Instagram or uh, TikTok or Whatever the rest of those are, I'm not sure, okay? And here's my point. Don't miss it. You got to stop the worship. And when I give my life to God, when I give my heart to God, when I, by faith, say, God, I want you to be first in my life. You know, the key to doing that is, it's not going through some kind of training program, though that's important. You need help. We want to help you. But it's real simple. Put God first. And the way you do that is to let him be the one that is your source. The tithe, put him first. And God promises to bless you when you do. Maybe today, uh, and I know we haven't talked about salvation today, but maybe online, you're like, you know what? I, you know, you talk about money, but I need to get my heart right with God. I need to get my eternal destiny settled. I would encourage you today to give your life Christ. Pray and ask him to save you. And if you do, click at the bottom and uh, let us know that uh, you pray to receive Christ. Last week we had um, we had someone get saved in the service. Listen to this. And you know, we said we're going to do the, uh, the trunk or treat. And we have a lot of people that said they're going to visit our church. You know what happened last Monday night? And for those of you that gave and brought candy and prayed and served and did a trunk, we had a, a, a young woman bring her three-year-old child And she came and 
she learned about our church. She went home and she watched our service online and she prayed to receive Christ last Monday night. Now, maybe you'd like to do that today too, okay? And uh, you can pray and, and Jonathan will be here in a moment to give us some instructions on our next steps. Whatever it is that God's speaking to you about, I hope today we'll obey the signs, the stop sign. Stop the worry. Don't worry. Stop the waste. We'll talk about managing it better in the next couple weeks. And stop the worship. And I believe if you see God as your source, that you will be blessed. Remember the word prosper in the Old Testament means that God is pushing you forward. What's God pushing you into? What's he pushing you forward in? What areas of your life is he trying to get you to prosper? I hope you'll give it to him and you'll be blessed. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you for the fact that uh, you gave us Jesus Christ and that uh, you have given us such wonderful truths in the Word of God to live our lives by. Help us to follow it and obey it. And we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.